Hey everyone, I'm Zane Burhani. And I'm Michael Satin. And today we're going to be talking to you guys about the five pitfalls of LVOT VTI. Before we begin, we'd just like to thank Dr. Robert Arnfield for his help with this screencast. So our objectives for today, we'll briefly talk about what the LVOT VTI is and why it's important, and then we'll dive right into our pitfalls. So what exactly is the LVOT VTI? Now we hope that most of our listeners are already aware of this, but if not, make sure to check out Western Sono's Stroke Volume Determination video for a better understanding of what the LVOT VTI is and how to actually acquire it. Suffice to say, the LVOT VTI is a surrogate for stroke volume. We assume the LVOT is shaped like a cylinder, and if you calculate the volume of that cylinder, we're able to determine what our stroke volume is. Now the height of that cylinder is actually our LVOT VTI. We know that the diameter is a static measurement that does not change, and most people have an LVOT diameter anywhere from 1.8 to 2.2 centimeters. Therefore, a VTI of 18 to 22 centimeters corresponds to a normal stroke volume of around 60 cc's in most patients. So let's jump right into a case. A 72-year-old female with a history of pulmonary hypertension presents to the emergency department with abdominal pain, appears to be septic, she's tachycardic, hypotensive, receives a liter of fluids, broad-spectrum antibiotics, and is started on vasopressor infusions. On POCUS, we can see that her LV ejection fraction appears to be pretty normal, but there is some interventricular septal flattening, maybe a component of RV volume or pressure overload. There's a significant amount of tricuspid regurgitation. Her RV is dilated Mike, bigger than Mike, her LV. Mike, what's the VTI? Well, Zane, that's, that's a single number. Like I said, this is a really complicated situation here. Can't just distill everything well, down listen, to a single Mike, number. Mike, I can tell you're very excitable, but what's the VTI? Well, the VTI is 24. Okay, so that's normal. Yeah, but, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of complexities to this case, Zane. Okay, I understand that, but let me ask you this. What's the point of the heart? Well, to, to pump blood forward, to perfuse organs. Uh, to generate a stroke volume? Y yeah, sure. And so what I would say is that despite all the badness and all the complexities going on here, at this point in time, the most valuable information you could obtain from your scan is the fact that this patient has a normal stroke volume. So why is the LVOT VTI important? Because as we have demonstrated, it is your surrogate for stroke volume and allows you to be able to calculate a patient's cardiac output regardless of whether you're in the eMERGE, in the ICU, or on the wards. By using your VTI as the surrogate for stroke volume and knowing a patient's heart rate, you can make this cardiac output determination at any point in time. If you're acquiring this 2D image and just take it at face value, all you'd really know is that this patient has a reduced ejection fraction. You could stop there, but we argue that taking it one step further and using LVOT VTI gives you such important information so you can determine that this patient's stroke volume and cardiac output are actually normal at this point in time, which is invaluable hemodynamic information. So now that we've talked about what the LVOT VTI is and hopefully convinced you of its importance, Let's dive right into our pitfalls. Pitfall number one is acquisition errors. So in order for you to obtain the most accurate VTI, you want your Doppler line of interrogation as parallel to the blood flow as possible. Now being off axis up to 20 degrees is acceptable, but anything beyond that, you will actually underestimate your VTI and it's no longer reliable. Now there's some physics involved here, which we're not gonna get into today, However, if you are interested, please make sure to check out Western Sono's Principles of Doppler video. Let's go over a few examples. So on the left here, we see a nice apical five chamber view with the color Doppler showing the LVOT. And on the right here, we have an off axis five chamber view as well. When you go to obtain your VTI, you can see because of how the heart's oriented, your Doppler line of interrogation is quite parallel in the left image. And as such, you get this beautiful VTI. Now it's a couple of things in the envelope that tell you you've acquired a good sample. The first one being the sample is quite narrow and the second being that you've got this bright white envelope on the outside and this dark black blood flow on the inside. Seeing the aortic valve closure represented here as the bright spike tells you that you're perfectly located in the LVOT just proximal to the aortic valve closure. On the right side however because the heart's off axis 
your Doppler flow is actually not parallel to your line of interrogation. And as such, you get this underestimated VTI of 13. And comparing these envelopes side to side, they have quite different morphology. So let's go over a few sampling location errors. So remember, in order for us to obtain a good LVOT VTI, we need to be in the LVOT. So on the left here, we can see that our pulse wave gate is placed in the LVOT just proximal to the aortic valve. On the right, however, we can see the pulse wave gate placed a little bit higher up in the LVOT. When we go to obtain our VTI, once again, on the left, we have that nice envelope. And on the right, we can see that morphologically, the envelope looks different. And we don't see that aortic valve closure. And so we know we're further up in the LVOT. And as such, our VTI is underestimated. Now, in order for you to obtain that perfect sample, make sure the pulse wave gate is placed just proximal to the aortic valve. And seeing that aortic valve closure can reassure you that you're in the right location. So another common issue we run into is tracing errors. So here's an example where the VTI is actually acquired really well. And on the left-hand side, the VTI envelope has been overtraced, And on the right-hand side, it's been undertraced. And what's important here to notice is that the exact same VTI sample gives you such a different result depending on how you trace it. So I would recommend just taking your time and tracing it accurately. Here is an example of how the wrong thing is being traced. So this blood flow here is actually happening in diastole, and you know that because you can see mitral inflow. Now for the early adopter of this technique, if you're not sure, although time consuming, you could use ECG leads to determine the phases of the cardiac cycle to ensure you're tracing the VTI envelope that's seen in systole. So let's move on to pitfall number two, LVOT obstruction. The important LVOT obstructions in a critically ill patient tend to be dynamic, such as systolic anterior motion, hokum, hyperdynamic basal segments from Tacitsubo. The reason why we care about these LVOT obstructions is because to obtain an accurate LVOT VTI, two principles must hold true. One is that we are assuming that the LVOT is a cylinder, and two, we must be able to measure the velocity of blood flow across the LVOT. So here's an example of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. And when we zoom in on that valve, you can see that the entire valve and annulus apparatus sucked into the LVOT during systole. Thus, the shape of the LVOT is distorted and is no longer a cylinder, violating that first principle. Another thing common to systolic anterior motion and most dynamic LVOT obstructions in a patient is that if you try to put color Doppler across the LVOT, you'll see this abnormal color flow combined pattern of blues, reds, yellows in a mosaic kind of appearance. Compare that to normal blood flow across the LVOT, which is this typical blue jet away from the probe during systole. So when you see this mosaic type pattern of color across the LVOT, what this means is that there's a significant amount of blood flow acceleration there exceeding the upper limits of detection. Seeing this may clue you into the fact that when you try to go and obtain your LVOT VTI, you'll get something that looks like this. This is aliasing where the machine is unable to determine whether blood flow is coming towards or away from the probe because it is at such high velocities. And thus, you cannot trace the LVOT VTI here or determine stroke volume, even if you tried. So, acquisition errors and dynamic LVOT obstructions make up most of the common pitfalls that we see with VTI acquisition. So you know what that means, Zane? We could just jump right into our shock series where we start using LVOT VTI to determine different types of shock. Mike, and Mike, slow your roll. I think we need to learn to walk before we learn to run. We've got a few more pitfalls to get through. I suggest we do that. All right, all right, Zane. So moving on to pitfall number three, aortic regurgitation. So patients that have moderate to severe aortic regurgitation actually get diastolic blood flow from not only the left atrium, but also the aorta. And as such, they end up with pretty high left ventricular end diastolic volumes. So during systole, when the LV contracts, a pretty large amount of blood is being ejected out of the LVOT. And as such, 
these patients have a higher than normal VTI. It's important to remember though, not all that blood is actually seeing the end organs because a percentage of that, depending on the severity of the AR, falls right back into the LV cavity. Reminds me a lot of feeding my kids, Zane. For every amount that I put in, only a certain amount gets to where it's supposed to, and a decent amount gets regurgitated back. So let's look at an example of this. So here in the peristernal long axis view, we can see this patient's got at least moderate AR, and we sort of see that as well in the apical five chamber view. When we go to obtain our VTI, we get a high VTI of 35. Now this is not surprising at all based on what I said. What's important to note though, that if a patient with moderate to severe AR has a quote unquote normal VTI of 18 to 22, that might actually be low for that patient. Pitfall number four is arrhythmia. Some of the most common arrhythmias that we run into are things like atrial fibrillation or significant amounts of atrial ectopy. The reason why this can affect your VTI is because there's beat-to-beat -beat variation in the amount of stroke volume being generated. Thus, to get an accurate determination of a patient's stroke volume, it's best to average at least five VTIs. And so for our final pitfall of today, we're going to talk about VTI versus stroke volume versus cardiac output. So let's jump into a case here where a patient comes into the hospital with pancreatitis in shock and the astute pocus sonographer goes right for the apical 5 and gets an LVOT VTI, which as you can see is measured there at 14 centimeters. What do you think, Zane? Well, low VTI, that means the patient's got a low stroke volume, right? Well, I'm glad you've been paying attention. In this instance, the low VTI didn't make sense when integrated into the clinical context. And so, the sonographer goes on to actually measure the LVOT diameter, which in this case was quite large at 2.7 centimeters, and thus the stroke volume was normal. If they had assumed that the LVOT diameter was in that normal 1.8 to 2.2 centimeter range, the stroke volume actually would have been underestimated. Well, hold the phone, Mike. Are you telling me that I have to measure LVOT diameters in all my patients now? No, Zane. Luckily, LVOT diameter does not change, and thus, in the equation of the volume of a cylinder, that initial part of the equation stays constant. It's the VTI that changes from moment to moment, day to day, as a patient's hemodynamics change. It is important to note that patients with a larger LVOT diameter, in this case 2.2 centimeters, really only need a VTI of 16 to be generating a normal stroke volume of around 60 cc's. And a patient with a smaller LVOT diameter of 1.8 centimeters would need a VTI closer to 23 and a half to be generating the exact same stroke volume. So to be as precise as possible, we would recommend measuring LVOT diameter when you can. However, you only ever need to measure it once because it should not, cannot, and will not change and so here is an example where VTI does not equate to cardiac output. So we have an apical four chamber here of LV that does not look very happy. We go to obtain our VTI and lo and behold, we get a normal VTI of 19.55. This yields a normal stroke volume of 72 cc's. So the reason this patient has a normal stroke volume is because this is a chronically dilated and compensated LV as well as the slow heart rate allows for increased diastolic filling time. And so this patient, despite having a severely reduced ejection fraction, is still able to generate a normal stroke volume. Now, of course, if we factor in this patient's slow heart rate, we get a pretty reduced cardiac output of 2.3 liters per minute. Now, this is a very important point that I wanna make that Mike alluded to earlier, is that if you just stopped at the ejection fraction, you would not get the whole picture. If you went that one step further and got that perfect VTI, keeping an eye for all those pitfalls that we talked about, you would be able to have a quantitative assessment of what this LV is able to do at this moment and guide your management accordingly. So I hope we haven't scared off you POCUS enthusiasts from using LVOT VTI at the bedside because although there are pitfalls you have to keep in mind, we truly believe it is one of the most important and useful clinical tools when assessing critically ill patients.
So stay tuned for our upcoming screencasts where we're going to show you how to use LVOTVTI to determine the cause of shock. Mike, now's your cue. Oh, yeah. Presenting Shock Series, starring Zane Burhani and Michael Satin. Coming spring, summer 2021. Prepare to be shocked.